Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CGAP webinar. We're delighted to have you all. Um, today, we'll be discussing uh, pretty exciting stuff around building rural caching, cash out agent networks around the world. Uh, we'll be sharing CGAP's global experience and uh, you know insights from our work across over eight countries. And we have the pleasure of um, um, being visited by guest speakers who will share their uh, on the ground experience coming from the direct uh, provider section, a uh, provider sector, right? So I'll go ahead and start introducing um, everyone here in the in the webinar. Um, I'll start with my our speakers. Uh, I'm John. I'm delighted to to have the presence of Sophia Arel. Uh, she's co-founder and COO of Shari, an e-commerce firm um, and fintech uh, operating in Morocco and several other African countries. Um, I also am joined by Amit Jain, who's director and CEO of Finopaytech, Fino which is one of the largest payment banks in India, uh, present in uh, pretty much all, all of the states. And also by Ugo Pacheco, who's chief uh, product and growth officer at Papersoft, a tech company that's building really cool solutions for agent network management uh, that uh, many, many providers are using across Africa. And lastly, my name is Emilio Hernandez. I'm senior financial sector specialist at CGAP, and, and I've been leading CGAP's work uh, on innovative agent models uh, um, across the globe. Good, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just before we get to it, I just wanna give you a little bit of uh, logistics. Uh, just bear in mind that this is um, an audio broadcast, uh, so your microphones will be muted, but you can ask questions at any point in time uh, using the chat box. Just be sure that uh, when you chat, your, your, when you send your questions, you do put in the option, um, uh, share with all participants so that we can all see your question. And this webinar will be recorded, and so you will uh, don't worry about the slides or uh, what was discussed here. You will have access to it through our CGAP website later on. Great. So the agenda today uh, is like this: we are going to I'm going to start presenting a little bit about the work and the insights that we bring. We really went. This is a culmination of over four and a half years of work uh, across eight countries where we really are um, synthesizing today, what are those five key actions, the top actions that result in moving the needle the most uh, in building rural agent networks so that you can take digital financial services to the masses of customers, including low income ones who tend to live in peri-urban and rural areas. Right? Then after presenting this work, we will open it up to a panel discussions uh, where we discuss a lot more nuance coming from providers themselves on the ground who have built these agent networks or are building these agent networks uh, in very different market contexts. So you understand a lot more of uh, the nuance of what it takes. So let me go ahead and, and get started. I'll start an intro on explaining uh, something that always comes up uh, in, in, in our discussions, you know, we're, we're trying to build digital financial ecosystems. So why are we talking about agent networks who are physical networks um, that uh, do cash in, cash out transactions? Well, you know, what we're trying is, is to promote digital transactions. Well, I'd like to start it at the reason we at CGAP really invested a lot of time in, in doing this is because we know that agent networks are a key building block for digital ecosystems in the realities where uh, in most countries around the world, cash is still very much used and in the pockets of uh, most customers uh, around the world. And here I'm showing two graphs that are really uh, have been documented by the Bank of International Settlements um, that give you a bit of the story, the global story about digital and cash. On the left-hand side, you will see how um, the cashless payments, the digital payments have been evolving right uh, across time. And you see in that black line how they have been growing very rapidly, especially after COVID, right? So you got more people adopting digital finance, digital payments 
very, very fast across the world. But the graph that I'm showing you on the right hand side shows what has happening to cash in circulation. Well, as digital payments and digital finance is booming, cash is not going away. Um, you see, for example, the red lines, uh, no, sorry, the yellow line represents, for example, India, um, a well-known case for uh, the, the, an explosion of digital uh, ecosystems. Cash, you know, decreased for a while through a government policy of demonetization, which really didn't work and was abandoned. And since then, cash in circulation has been increasing. The same you would argue for countries like China, the purple line, also close to the yellow line. Um, you know, the trend is, is, is upward. And overall, the average for emerging markets and development economies, which is that green dotted line, follows a similar trend. It's very stable, very, very stable. And even in COVID, where you saw a spike in digital adoption, there was also a spike in cash in circulation. So cash is very much part of the how, of, of how uh, economies are structured, especially developing economies that have large informal sectors that pay in cash. So the bulk of the customers, of the low-income customers, even if they have a, an account and a smartphone and internet, they're earning in cash. And so they need to transform that cash into digital currency so that they can start the digital transactions that we want. So that is why agent networks are, are very important. Now, the problem that we also saw in CGAP uh, globally is that even though agent networks have been proliferating very in a very healthy manner in the big urban hubs, there are very big gaps in coverage when it comes to peri-urban areas and rural areas, right? And there's also a big gender gap in terms of the use of digital financial services and also the participation of women as part of agent networks, right? And that's really what our work has been about in the four uh, years that uh, we've been doing this, really trying to determine what are the innovations that can take agents rural and reduce the gender gap. So I'll start a little bit with this with these insights, right? Um, what we've done across the four and a half years is that we really kind of mapped out globally all of those successful cases where rural agents have reached scale and try to find common principles for how to enable those uh, at scale, right? So they were achieved in different ways, but there are commonalities around those countries on how both government and private sector in the, in the financial industry have managed that. Then we moved and, and we really started understanding that there are different ways to apply those principles. You know, it depends on the market context, of course. So we, we stylized the three main journeys through which we've seen agent networks grow, led by either a strong drive of, um, you know, P2P transfer payments or G2P subsidy distribution or e-commerce, right? Depending on which part in the world you are. And what we're presenting today is the culmination of this journey of, of this learning journey that CGAP has done, where we have um, key, we have focused on, on five countries where we work with providers to really push the needle and go into rural areas. And this is where we have found um, five key country action plan, action uh, that will allow you to uh, move into rural areas, right? So this is very much from, from a local perspective uh, with local providers in certain markets that we're gonna be sharing now. And the whole body of knowledge, you can find it in our, in our collection page at CGAP, uh, the Kiko collection page. I'll summarize the, the, in, the essence of all the innovations that we've seen is where providers are, work, are able to work a new business model that moves away from having you know, an exclusive agent with one single financial service provider providing only the services that that provider offers, targeting a specific demand, and you transform your agents into more or less an open platform where with a single agent float account, various services, digital services, fin financial and non-financial can be facilitated by that agent. And that aggregation of services have really transformed the economics of agents, making them viable even in the rural areas where there are fewer customers around that agent, because those customers will do more transactions, each one, right? Enabling the viability. 
but how you achieve that really changes a lot from from place to place, right? But that's a, a common principle that we that we've seen, and uh, the five actions that we discussed today are meant to gear to achieve this service aggregation goal. So let's get to into to these five key actions. Um, I'll I'll just say that these actions are really um, uh, we try to synthesize from the many things you have to do to push rural agent networks, what are the top five that we found are most catalytical in creating change in moving agent networks to rural areas? And we have ranked them in a way that uh, ideally would one uh, key action solve would facilitate the other one going forward, right? So I'll, I'll get straight into them. The first action that we talk a lot about that we find is, is absolutely critical is for DFS providers themselves to build a very crystal clear vision of why they want to go to rural areas um, and understand the business and, and the business processes that will get them there and the investment requirements and getting that right. It might sound very simple, but really going rural is not for every DFS provider, right? It really has to fit where the, with the long-term vision of where they wanna grow. Because going rural is not a longer, a, a, a short-term game is a long-term game, right? Um, you don't start in rural areas necessarily, you build towards going to rural areas. So having that vision clear, I think it's it's critical and it's, it's not always evident from, 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 from DFS providers on why they would want to go to them. Uh, rural. But once once from those service providers that do get it, and, and we find that the ones who get it uh, are, are the ones who really aspire to become mass market leaders, meaning that they, they really are aiming to get to various type of customer segments, including lower income customer segments, like a universal bank would, right? Um, those who do, it's very important that they really pay attention to the marked differences that exist between your rural customers and agents versus your urban, their urban counterparts, right? Because they do vary a lot in terms of capacities, in terms of trust, in terms of habits, uh, and in terms of the type of DFS products that they find most valuable. And that's why it's very critical at that early stage to do a rural market assessment that really gets into the nuance on the profiles, the pain points, and the financial needs of both rural agents and customers to start building your rural expansion strategy. Right? This is key, this assessment is key. I don't think there are any shortcuts that we've seen that, to get away from that because um, if you don't, you made up, you might end up trying to go rural, not recognizing uh, beforehand the investment requirements of going rural. They might take you by surprise and you would not be prepared to make those investments and you would pull out, right? And we've seen that also in, in many cases. So that's the, that's the first step. Um, the second crucial step actually falls in the regulation uh, realm, right? Because one of the biggest constraints that we found is the regulation around um, know your agent requirements, right? The type of minimum requirements that regulators ask providers to enforce when onboarding agents. Now it's global good practice to have tiered KYA requirements, meaning that you have a lower tier that is meant to be simplified so that it's easier for, let's say, lower capacity type of agents to be eligible. Um, and it's restricted also in terms of they can do the less risky transactions like cash in, cash out. It's one of the less risky transactions because all of these transactions are real time, right? Um, however, getting that lower tier right is an issue. Most of the markets where we worked, even if they do have a lower tier, it's not tailored to the realities of rural entrepreneurs. So central banks need to be really sensitive to what are the dominant profiles of rural entrepreneurs who can become agents. Because if they set that bar of KYA too high, um, none of those rural entrepreneurs will be eligible. So no matter how much 
you know, your visionary DFS providers want to go rural, they just won't be able to recruit your uh, rural agents. And so in this guide that we just published, you will see, you know, the nuances of what are the risk-based measures that you could use to get simplified, truly simplified KYA that meets most of rural entrepreneurs' requirements. But you also have some measures to counterbalance risk, right? Like limiting the value of the transactions that they do or the number of transactions per day that they do to limit some of the other concerns that regulators have, like such as money laundering and, and um, you know, financing counterterrorism. Good. Um, now let's move back to the third question that goes back to DFS providers and actually policymakers. So once you you build a vision to go rural, um, you know, it's one of the critical aspects of a rural expansion strategy is how are you going to actually train and onboard and support these rural agents. This is a physical network of people, right, that you need to reach out to, you need to train, uh, you need to support, especially their liquidity management. And that is very, very costly. It's one of the costliest cost elements of going rural. And you need to figure out how you're going to fund that investment, right, as in your long-term growth strategy. Now, we've seen some cases where DFS providers, private DFS providers, just figure it out and convince their investors and are able to fit the bill. Like, And, and you, you can give some very famous examples of those. And PESA and Kenya, is, for the most part, that expansion rural area is a private venture. Or banks in Colombia, Bank Colombia, uh, is another good example that they were able to do it. But the reality is that most cases that we've seen all over, in other parts of the world, it, it, is, it is this part where public collaboration with the private sector becomes very important, where the government can, through various programs, subsidize in a way, partly subsidize that training of rural agents. Because the, the issue is that rural agents tend to be lower skilled and have lower literacy than the urban counterparts. And if you are able to do massive trainings uh, to to get that those skills gaps eliminated. Then you got the pro providers have been able to easily invest in onboarding these agents and going forward. And we we have documented examples of such type of public private collaboration, like the rural Taobao program in China or India's uh, Bank Saki program, which which are are discussed in our in our publications. The fourth step that we have is um, really um, DFS providers, um, as they start onboarding agents and become good at that, um, the more they reach out to rural areas, the more remote rural areas, the more expensive it gets. And so there's a point in time where you really have to think about outsourcing agent network management functions, meaning find a partner that is already in that rural remote area doing some kind of business and convince and work out a deal to have that partner help you distribute your digital financial services, right? And that should be cheaper than you going out there by yourself onboarding your, those mm -hmm. rural agents directly. Right? And so we give a criteria in, in our guide on how would you, when, when is it the right time to outsource? For some firms, it's very early on. For other firms, it's later on. But the, it always comes to that time where you need to discuss outsourcing. And how do you select your partner profiles depending on your financial institution? Right. So uh, we, we, we delve into those details um, in our guide. And the last one, but not least one, is um, really acknowledging the potential of onboarding more women as agents and customers. We document uh, the enormous benefits that onboarding women as agents bring for DFS providers in terms of open up new markets. Uh, new customer segments that you had no access before. Um, we document the costs, you know, the, 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 the very big cost of onboarding more women because I mentioned that rural and urban agents tend to have a skills and asset gap and working capital gap. Well, rural women among rural agents, the gap is even further, right? And that's, that's the trend that we find. So there's an even bigger need to have public-private collaboration you know, reduce those, it and it's social, you know, social norms induce gaps, right? It's not, it's not because they're women that they have a gap, it's because 
the social norms have prevented those women from gaining those gap, those skills and that working capital. And we need to accelerate the reduction of that gap so that they incorporate at on masses. And we, we talk about all of the strategies um, that we've seen between government and, 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 and private sector actors in the financial um, industry to, to do that, right? And one of the most prominent ones is actually in India with the Bank Saki program, where we learned a lot. So those are the five key actions in a nutshell. And uh, I'll stop talking here and I'll switch my hat from presenter to moderator because we really want to, this is very high level what I presented, right? We really want the nuance on the ground coming from direct providers like our guest speakers. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start the discussion around questions and I'll ask our speakers to, to contribute uh, their experience from, from, from their different markets. I'll start with one question and, and I'll stop sharing my screen so that when you answer, people can see our, our, our guest speakers. But the first question is, you've heard me say that, you know, it's, it's really important for a, for, for a financial service um, a provider to build that vision of why they would want to go rural. Um, could you share your own organization's experience in first uh, saying why you thought it was worthwhile uh, to try and go rural? And second, what are the learnings you have accumulated in terms of what makes rural agents different from urban agents and what that has implied in your processes, right? Um, and perhaps I, 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 I start with, with Sophia sharing a little bit of her experience at Shari in Morocco and, and other parts of North Africa. Thank you uh, very much, Emilio, and thank you for having me today. Um, so Emilio, before answering your question, what I would like to do is give a brief context about what we do at Sherry and explain a little bit our strategy that will actually answer your, your question. Um, so I am the co-founder and COO of Sherry. Sherry is basically a B2B e-commerce app for small uh, mom and pop shops. They have different names across the continent. You can call them retailers, grocery shops, um, uh, food grocery shops, etc. And these guys, we basically provide them with an app where they can order any consumer goods they sell, get delivered for free after a few hours while benefiting from some financial services like payment, micro insurance or micro credit. So the company was launched in January 2020. In order to be able to launch a direct financial services, we received a payment institution license from the Central Bank of Morocco. And we are currently preparing our technology in order to launch our financial services. So we are the very beginning of our story. And uh, what I wanted to say is that we've been focusing on Francophone Africa with operations in Morocco, Tunisia, Côte d'Ivoire, but we will be focusing our fintech uh, uh, services at the beginning in Morocco because this is where we got the, the right license to do that. And the way we want to build our financial services is by trying to build an ecosystem that makes sure that we can accept payment in something else than cash. So as opposed to different players that are currently existing in Morocco, the way we think about the payment ecosystem, whether it's in uh, cities or rural areas, is that we really want to build a B2B ecosystem that is incentivized at the idea of using payments because uh, cash is still uh, uh, very much used in, in Morocco and Morocco has actually been ranked first country in the world in terms of cash usage. So the idea is to build the ecosystem for, for acceptance of payment other than cash and then deploy the payment uh, options through end users. So our strategy is more around B2B customers and then B2B to C customers. So the idea is to become a real uh, player in terms of financial inclusion because the banking penetration rates are low in Morocco and uh, uh, people are actually in need of financial services uh, that are very simple, like bin bill payment, uh, uh, um, 
merchant payment, money transfer, etc. So why do we believe rural areas are very important to target? Because rural areas are where the banking penetration rates are very low. There is clearly a, a cash flow from large cities to rural areas and it's usually you know people moving from rural areas going to look for work in in big city and helping out their families uh, uh, in the rural area so there is a flow of cash that is today a bit uh, um, inconvenient for them. And the idea is to really work on equipping rural areas with an ecosystem where they can we can digitize the flow of cash and have a real impact in terms of financial uh, inclusion. So uh, we, we truly believe that if we want to become a financial inclusion player, we need to address both cities and rural areas, and we truly believe that we are going to do it in 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 a, in a, in a sequenced way. Meaning, we're going to build the ecosystem by working with B two B players, and then going to address B two C um, players. So we we've worked a lot with CGAP in order to look at you know, what are the kind of products that could be interesting for rural areas and who are the agents who can help us push those products. And we've identified a few things that are very important for rural areas and that address a little bit the how. A few products that we've ident identified with CGAP that are a must have is basically bill payment, money transfer, savings and online payment. And the idea is to onboard different types of merchants from grocery shops to small merchants, but also who are usually male owned. But we also believe that we need to onboard women agents in order to help us push the services to be to B to B to C clients because uh, uh, women have an important role to play within the families and the societies, and other women can relate uh, uh, to them and uh, uh, feel that they are in a trustworthy environment. So we will also be looking at agents like women cooperative, agricultural cooperative that we believe we can on board as agents and that can help us spread financial um, services. So I think I, I've answered a little bit the why and, and the how. Thank you, Sophia. That, that, that's fantastic. And, it, and it's great to learn that that particular context in Morocco. Maybe we, we, move, uh, we move from Morocco, fly all the way mentally to India where Amit is. And, and maybe Amit, you can, you can tell us Fino Payments uh, story, why? Why go rural and have you, what's the difference between rural customers and agents and urban customers in your experience? Um, thank you, Emilio, for having us here today. Um, so, Emilio, I guess, you know, um, we started off our journey. And so, first of all, you know, let me try and explain what FINO stands for. So, FINO is a short form for Financial Inclusion Network and Operations. And this was coined in way back in 2006 when we started off with this. So, so our intent was very clear from day one that we wanted to you know, kind of take ahead the financial inclusion journey for a country like India. Now, in last 16, 17 years, you would have read that you know there is a there's a phenomenal change which has happened in our country with regard to you know digitization and everything and today probably we are at the top of you know uh, the league with regard to doing the most number of you know digital transaction uh, in in a country and so on and so forth but you know these are like you know while these 15 years would be like ages uh, you know if that uh, launch pad was not created so as we know, uh, we did not had any choice or we did not had any you know, uh, ambiguity in our thought process that India is a country of villages. We have some 600,000 villages in the country of which even today, uh, being also one of the best also, we have been able to reach only around 35 to 40 percent of those villages. Because maybe the rest of the villages are too small or, or you know, uh, may not be economically viable at this point in time. But the intent is to reach out to each and every village in the country. So 600,000 villages, we have been able to cover approximately uh, 2,500,000 villages in the country at this point in time. So, so we are very clear that, you know, rural is the way and customer need our services in the rural as compared to in the urban. That's, you know, in, in India, there are a lot of, you know, different kind of banks 
So, uh, and, and those are pretty well present in uh, urban areas uh, to a large extent. While there are challenges in urban areas as well, and uh, I, I don't want to touch too much on that aspect, uh, but uh, rural was like a, a, like a clean slate or, or, you know, the, so I think what has have also happened in our country is that, you know, in last seven, eight years, there has been dramatic shift. The government has done, you know, a lot of initiatives of, you know, bringing or opening accounts for each and every individual. And uh, this Jan Trinity, what we call in our, in our, in our country, which means basically a Jandhan account, which is a basic saving account, um, uh, a mobile phone and the accessibility part, you know, all those things, you know, put together. Uh, Aadhaar is our biometric, you know, uh, solution, uh, which is our, you know, something like a, a national level, uh, you know, identity program. So all these things put together today, uh, India or Fino as such is kind of, you know, is able to reach out to the rural and the volume of transactions which you read or see across the world is coming, started coming from the rural parts of the country. So, uh, you know, the first part of my answer would be that. So in the learning part, if you ask me, uh, uh, there is there is obviously a difference between the rural and the urban segment. Uh, the kind of, you know, products which a rural uh, agent uh, sells vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, a product which uh, urban agent sells is in a, in a way slightly different. So that's on the customer profiling, behavior, everything as well. Uh, uh, but so, so we spend a lot of, you know, this thing on the training aspect of the rural, uh, rural agents because they are a little, you know, uh, on the learning curve. So there is a lot of investment required out there. So those are the those are the important aspects which differentiate the rural versus the urban. And I'm assuming that you know rest the important points any which is you know uh, most of the people are aware. So I'll. I'll, yeah. I'll Thank you. No, it's uh, it's it's interesting that the difference in in in, in skills and assets that you that you were hinting at between rural and urban agents is something we we also see spread out. Moving to, to Ugo now, Ugo, uh, from paper source perspective and your experience across across Africa, working with different financial institutions, uh, again, what would be, how would you, how would you describe the, the the decision of going rural and what is the difference between urban and, and rural agents and and customers? Thank you, Emilio. Uh, thank you for, for the invite to participate. So just a little bit of context, because we're not a provider. We're a software house that provides a white label uh, software for, for uh, uh, digital financial providers to develop their own products on, on the distribution. So typically, the, the pain points that we found out on, on the last mile distribution would be related to identity. That would be a blocker for people to participate you know, on, on, on the space of the financial sector. The other one would be the, the infrastructure itself that uh, it's uh, it has its its limitations, especially around online and offline. The cost of data, uh, the the literacy that exists both for the the, the person is providing the service and the person that that is being onboarded to to this uh, new digital uh, economy uh, as well. Then the the orchestration of different business models, and I will touch this point specifically here on rural because we have different customers, uh, and uh, that, that that's quite important of the, how the regulatory environment restricts the, the the operation, and then you also have the different models. And many times you want to change the business model when you go into 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 rural space. And then the last one would be uh, as a low code uh, last mile banking platform, we we. We designed this uh, with the intent to to have it uh, um, in in a way where you can design new products for different types of uh, agents that you, you you onboard. So managing the risk is important. So all of this will touch the the, the point that you mentioned relates to rural and urban. So we have we've started our journey on on helping uh, MPES in Vodacom in Mozambique and DRC. Then we went to Angola with Postal Bank and more more, more recently we, we've reached and helped uh, Nigerian uh, financial sector incorporating the digital identity into the, the, the point of sale. That's kind of our journey. More recently, we, we, we've done some work uh, integrating now microfinance companies that are uh, taking more participative, participative roles in, in, the, in the digital space. Uh, digitizing also the the, the microfinance uh, uh, staff and and their operation. So coming back to to your question, I think the the key success here is because we've been on, on the technology development is have kind of ultra localized capacity. 
so that uh, providers are able to design the business model that would fit different strategies. So we have companies like, you know, portfolio like Advanced Microfinance that they have a strategy in Ivory Coast to target specifically uh, customers um, customers that uh, act on, on cocoa, uh, agri-based uh, agri uh, income. So that's one strategy. But then you have different uh, customers, for example, in Nigeria that tackle uh, rural uh, and, uh, and, or pre-urban areas where identity is, is, a, is a showstopper. So for us, the capacity not only to work offline, but have this autonomous capacity into customers' uh, um, autom capacity building or, or on designing and adapting their business model is actually crucial because each of them will define different partnerships. And I think partnerships are quite important here when you're trying and piloting and testing, and then when you're scaling, if you want to to to, to change the different types of uh, contracts and relationships that you, you have with this uh, with this uh, with these companies that you you find out that could be either financial services that don't limit the market, they actually partner partnering up to address differently the market. So that's basically what we've seen, especially now that uh, some of the agent network uh, management companies that are pooling uh, um, a service, different service provider, like Amit uh, said, uh, where they started, they are now becoming more technology prone. And so they want to um, have different segments of, of, of agents so that they can balance the services that they offer and they test new things into the market. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. And, and you started getting at to those, those issues around service aggregation and uh, the role of agent network managers. Um, so in, in my presentation, I, I discussed some of those steps related to that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I mentioned in, 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 our, in our insights that the, the idea of creating an ecosystem that aggregates services and, and distributes those services through an agent and the ability to reach out further through agent network managers, which implies for a financial service providers to outsource some of the agent network, agent network management functions seems to be key to reach scale in rural areas. My question to you is, can you comment what are the strategies you have used in your respective organizations or are considering using as you move into the financial service space to achieve better unit economics and aggregate services? And how do you see the role of agent network managers um, as part of this process of moving rural with a wider suite of services for uh, peri-urban and rural customers? Perhaps uh, in this time, we start with you, Amit. It's, uh, it's your, your well-established uh, financial institution, but you, you have like two, Two big business lines. You're you're a financial service provider yourself, but you're also an agent network manager for other banks in India. Could you explain a bit the the role of service aggregation and and the role of AMs uh, and why that is important in your strategy? Sure. Um, so when we started off, you know, way back in two thousand six, uh, the option for us was, uh, you know, to become an agent, uh, you know, management network for other banks because we were a fintech at that point in time. So we started working for various banks in the country, you know, understanding the landscape, the service delivery, the technology. That time, you know, in India, uh, we had a challenge with regard to the connectivity pieces as well. We were still on 2G and, you know, then 3G evolved and so on and so forth. So we kept evolving, learning, uh, you know, on the technology as well as on the service delivery side of these conversations. Uh, now, on the basis of this strength over a period of time uh, from a fintech, uh, the regulator, you know, uh, came up with a new, uh, you know, set of uh, this thing wherein they wanted to, you know, kind of uh, have a deeper penetration of financial inclusion and payments in the country and for which they came up with a separated kind of a license, uh, which I guess, you know, even Sophie, uh, Sophia mentioned at, you know, some point that, you know, India country, there is a differentiated kind of license. So India, there is something called as a payments bank. Uh, so, you know, as a payment bank, we are allowed to do transactions uh, open bank accounts, do various kinds of transactions. But the only limitation with the payment bank in the current you know, uh, license regime is that we cannot give uh, out loans or uh, asset products. So, so that's the differentiator you know, between a normal bank and a payment bank in our country, in India. 
So as a BCNM uh, or, or as an agent network, we uh, gained a lot of understanding, depth, technological prowess uh, 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 as we kind of, you know, worked across the ren landscape of the country. Uh, on the basis of that, the regulator uh, in India, which is the Reserve Bank of India, they uh, allowed us to have a license of uh, payments bank. And we started off in payments bank around 2015-16. So our focus has been on uh, this kind of a network only. So whether it is an agent network or uh, aggregated agent network in India, we call them as a corporate BC, as in corporate business correspondent. So even today, uh, as a bank, uh, we have less than 100 branches across a vast and diverse country like India. Uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of, you know, uh, it's it, it's too less, you know, from, from a perspective, that perspective. But our entire network strength is dependent on two major factors. One is typically there are mom and pop stores, Kirana stores, you know, grocery stores, which acts as a as a you know uh, our agent network uh, which delivers our banking services now there is a second side where there are also cer certain you know gas stations or service stations uh, which we have tied up uh, thanks to you know uh, the fact that you know we are invested by one of the largest uh, you know gas company or gas you know let's say service company in the country we call them as an oil marketing company in india so they've invested in us and as a strategy, we move forward with them. And today, you know, we have approximately 20,000 plus uh, petrol pumps in India. We call them as petrol pumps. Uh, so there we are present in, in, in deep rural across the country on all highways and, you know, uh, all those locations. So our strategy has been to go rural, to go out all across not just through mom and pop stores, but also through, you know, a very dedicated, um, uh, proper infrastructure, you know, uh, places like, but we have not created our own infrastructure. We have just, you know, it's a shared infrastructure. Uh, uh, a petrol company also gets a lot of footfall, uh, which may translate into not just a banking transaction, but, uh, you know, like a, like a mall or a, foot, uh, a footfall is a business. So if there is more customer, they'll probably tend to buy some, you know, petrol diesel from uh, that place as well. So so it's it's a very interesting and synergetic, you know, this thing which I've probably not come across any such example across the world and not at this scale. So, so that is, a, again, a very interesting, you know, thing which we have done. Uh, uh, there are other challenges which we have faced with regard to, let's say, the cash management part of it, which in, in some part of your you know presentation, you had mentioned that, you know, it's, it's a very costly affair. And, you know, availability of that is also very difficult. And uh, we know that, you know, in a diverse and a very distinct country like India, it, it's probably the challenge become, you know, slightly much more. So these petrol pumps or these gas stations, they have a lot of cash which comes to them while some amount of, you know, um, sale happens digitally. But there is a lot of sales of their regular products, which is, you know, gasoline, petrol, diesel, that happens in cash. So that cash can be recycled or recirculated within the local, you know, um, economy, so to say, uh, whether by the petrol pump, who is acting as a agent network, or the peripheral, you know, agents can also come and pick up their cash. So now they don't have to be dependent on a bank branch, which we have very limited. Uh, uh, or, or any other bank branch network for cash. Uh, so that's another very interesting aspect which we have been able to crack in our country. And last but not the least, what we have also done is that we have tied up with a lot of you know uh, financial institutions, uh, non-banking financial companies, e-com delivery companies who have a lot of cash collected at different you know geographies because of you know cash on delivery or various other models so they also have a lot of cash which comes their way and these cash can be utilized in a very localized manner uh, is what we have tied up so we have been able to crack those you know pieces components in a very diverse and, and it takes time and it is still a work in progress so to say but we have been largely able to crack that piece and hence uh, we have been able to kind of you know uh, ensure that there is a fair amount of delivery of cash at a very you know competitive rates or or uh, you know those kind of things are available cash is available and so even during covid you know uh, if there was a different dimension of a problem where people did not have um, cash or or money in their account but you know whenever there was money in their account they never faced problem with regard to you know taking out cash through a network you know uh, like ours so, so that was another, you know, uh, interesting aspect.
you, Amin. Uh, thank you, Amin. I, I, um, that, that was very, very insightful on how you also describe the type of partners that you have seen. You have also the mom and pop stores, but also more structured chains like the petrol stations, all based on their coverage in rural areas that, that you may not have. So you're building upon that, which is a, a principle that we've seen. Um, maybe we'll go over to you, Sophia. In the case of Shari, since you're starting your financial journey, what have you thought around the, 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 the your future role about um, whether, you know, providing uh, onboarding agents yourself or acting as an agent network manager or providing your own digital financial services? Can you comment on that? Yes, um, it will be a pleasure. But first, I just want to say that I really liked what Amit said, uh, said around one mutualized agent network and giving the example of, of gas stations and two, uh, the the cost of cash uh, of handling cash and this these are two challenges that we have really been uh, thinking about and we truly believe that uh, we decided to go for a b2b e-commerce model with embedded fintech because the cost of these two things are basically already been captured by the e-commerce activity I think it's very hard to build an agent network by itself, except if, of course, you mutualize it and you have customers who are using your, your, your network, and it's also very costly to handle cash. So the way we have been thinking about this, and this is what we're going to experiment in the next weeks, is that uh, today... I'm going to tell you how the e-commerce activity works and then explain how we believe we can incorporate agents and cash by in an embedded way. So um, today, our e-commerce activity is basically mostly mom and pop shops ordering uh, FMCG products, getting delivered by our delivery boys and paying cash on delivery. The delivery boys collect this cash and this cash is either deposited directly by the delivery boys in our bank accounts or deposited back to our warehouses to a cashier that then has a, a, a company specialized in, in cash collection that comes and, and, and picks the money. And this is the case for all FMCG distributors and cash management is a huge cost for everyone. Um, the way we have been thinking about our financial services is to first use our delivery boys as our agents. So we are mutualizing their work as delivery boys, and we're basically going to use them as agents who will, who will one, educate and push people to download the, the, the wallet, use the wallet, but two, they will be able to act as cash-in, cash-out agents. So these delivery boys will be like a mobile ATM for people who want to top up their wallet or take some, some cash out of their wallet. And it's true mutualization that we believe we it can make sense in terms of cost. Uh, the second thing, the second step we are going to move, the second thing we have thought about is that today we have opened what we call Sherry stores. It's basically cash and carry stores that are close to our clients. Our customers can walk a few minutes, go inside the store, um, uh, order some goods, get delivered, or it's like a click and collect model like McDonald's. And when they enter the store, they can also ask the, 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 the cashier at the store to do some cash in and cash out for them. And again, the store acts as an agent network. The network is still small, but we can imagine onboarding other agents who are our current customers. So a mom and pop shop can become an agent at, at some point for us and do cash in and cash out for uh, B2C customers. And this is why I really liked the example of the gas station, because I believe that we need to materialize existing uh, 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 shops uh, uh, with their existing activity onboard them as our agents so that they can, for them, use the agent work as an extra revenue stream. And for us, it's lower cost because they mutualize what they do with being our, our agent. So that's how we, we thought about the agent network is trying to materialize it and use our delivery boys as basically cash collectors in order to optimize 
for uh, uh, for the, co the 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 cost of cash. And this is even more relevant when you think about rural areas, because in cities, like there are always other ways that you can find, like you can partner with the bank branches, you can partner with the uh, money transfer branches, etc. But in rural areas, who is really close to 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 people who are going to be using payment services? It's basically mom and pop shops, gas stations, uh, um, uh, small markets, cooperative, etc. And these guys, we really want to onboard them as our agents because they are going to be close to the population. And it's only by embedding those financial services on top of their existing work that we believe it can economically make sense and it can be scalable. So that's a fascinating uh, example uh, of your plan, and, and indeed, uh, we, we've been we, we learned a lot through that that analysis we did with you, Sophia. Um, Hugo, over to you in terms of your experience uh, about uh, service aggregation. How do you achieve that? Uh, you know, making it viable into in rural areas. Thank you, Emily. So uh, basically, what Hamid and, and Sophia have, have been sharing is kind of the, the best practices that the market is doing is find informal channels that exist and formalize it uh, in, in, in a way that is possible to drive the, the digital economy on top of it. It's kind of what, what, I, what I have been getting also from, from project to project. I think there's two aspects. So just complementing this, this first one that, that we have uh, um, talked about, uh, identifying the liquidity needs uh, is, is important to have a central control that you can understand exactly what are the, the movements of cash that you have and the, the lack uh, of, uh, of uh, sometimes players, sometimes more available cash to, into that region is important as a overall technology uh, set that, that you have um, in place to, to manage your, your, your operation. So that, I think that, that will be the, my technology and on how, how, how we uh, solve this. Um, we see a lot of, of these points that we've been talking about is uh, at the end of the day, how do I uh, optimize my uh, uh, cash uh, mobilization? And there's a lot of good experience from microfinance and I'm kind of new into microfinance because we are embedding now a, a big financial player that, that is using the technology that we used previously on retail banking, on mobile money agent networks. So what I find it fa fascinating is that the capacity that they have on organiz organization on cash collection and, and cash, cash distribution. So using the technology to be able to do this seamlessly in offline. So we ended up developing a, a, a way to uh, identify the customer, do the, the customer identity uh, um, offline, and then use a capacity to transact, uh, tapping in into USSD rails to execute the, the, the transaction already previously identifying the, the, the customer successfully offline. So we have we had to design um, technology that would make possible these transactions to happen in an environment that you, you cannot cater for, for, for online all the time or scarcely or costly. The next point that I would go, and I will give the example that we did with uh, Airtel and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Smart Cash, that is a PSP in, in Nigeria. So the, the capacity to attach new product lines into, into the agents, especially on rural, not only uh, um, helps them in, in, in the adding additional revenue streams because at the end of the day, it gets uh, a little disruption on, on their daily, daily business when you have new products on top of it uh, because you end up having uh, multiple physical uh, boxes of money and digital boxes of, of, of money to, to handle. So having the capacity to have multiple products that would make sense for specific segments and in in, uh, in Airtel specifically and, and uh, smart get, uh, smart cash PSB, we handled the, the the identity space capacity to enrollment on DVN and mean to agents. This tapped in into an additional revenue stream for for agents. So not only a new total addressable market that now they are able to to to, to tap in, but facilitating that. Uh, into uh, enable the customers to enter enter the, the digital economy. So that was really important factor and putting government services here unblocks a lot of a lot of uh, uh, this uh, revenue streams uh, that, that are important. 
the next one that we see uh, also in you is how we tap in additional value-added services. And another one is, is basically how we attach uh, cards into, into the, the, the scheme of, of distribution. So tapping into giving cards to customers, but we do uh, pre-printed cards, but we do a verification of the customer with biometrics before we end, end, end over uh, um, a card for, for him to, to manipulate. So I think it's, it's this two in combination. The first one that we talk about the liquidity. And as we go more rural, these partnerships are very important because they need more uh, and a uh, hugely amount of more money. Uh, yeah. So they are, you need to balance that, uh, the a ms that you onboard as outsourcing, as you mentioned, but they will need additional volumes of money. So partnership with the, with banks and, and, and microfinance are important so that you have uh, this in place, this kind of triangle of, of virtue in place and you're able to support them with liquidity when they need so that they don't block and stop the the flow the the money flow that will stop them to to operate and have them additional revenue streams that are not uh, a pain point for them and don't disrupt their day-to-day -day, uh, operation thank you thank you um so i i'm conscious we are we're running uh, a, a bit late and and i just want to ask uh, the last question very overall but very your your in, in a short one minute answer uh what has been what is the potential of onboarding women agents um in in, in your experience um uh perhaps uh we start with a myth uh that where india has a, has a lot of of, of collaboration with the public and private sector on this what 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 does it take to onboard women agents at scale i mean uh, so, you know, when we started off, you know, there are obviously challenges and higher level of challenges in onboarding a lady as in, you know, not because that, you know, CC is probably a better financial manager as compared to a person, you know, I don't want to make any gender specific, you know, this thing, but that's probably, you know, true in a lot of uh, geographical, you know, this thing just because of the cultural thing which we come from. Uh, but important to, you know, what we have observed is that, you know, ladies have come forward and they are doing better business uh, in, in, you know, a lot of spaces and everything. Uh, I think the key differentiator what we have observed is that, you know, whether it is a lady or a person, somebody who is able to put in more number of, you know, uh, engagement or hours as in, you know, with regard to that, they have been more successful, you know. Uh, obviously, there are softer aspect of a lady, you know, interacting with another lady and, you know, giving them that comfort and everything. But, you know, a lady in India, you know, she has to, you know, when I'm saying I'm making a generic statement. So she has to, you know, do a lot of other activity as well. She's not 100% devoted for, you know, if, if she's not 100% devoted for the, the program, then, you know, she also has to take care of her family thing, you know, her, you know, uh, uh, this thing. And then, you know, whatever time which she gets, if she's able to do that banking, that in a way at times limits the scope. But having said that, uh, because the paucity of time, I would say that the program has been hugely successful. And as you have mentioned somewhere else, uh, apparently we have around 11 to 15 percent of the entire network, uh, which is coming from ladies. There has been a lot of uh, help, support and this thing from the government and that's where you know this flagship program of bc saki has taken up and we have seen that you know there's a lot of traction the ladies are trained by the government you know given to us we kind of you know further trained them into specific products and so on and so forth so uh, my you know this thing would be that ladies are better as compared to you know this thing but it is again the engagement level is more important second and more importantly, the, the social fabric has changed quite a bit. When a lady starts, you know, doing this business or this activity, her, you know, stature uh, among her peer, you know, family members or everything, you know, improves quite a bit. The the kid starts looking up, you know, uh, to the lady that, you know, uh, even, even that is also great. So uh, at times, you know, this is entirely supported. Uh, the lady is the face of it. Uh, it is being supported by the entire family. Somebody will go and fetch cash for the lady as in, you know, the cash is not there. Maybe it is two kilometer, five kilometer down the, you know, somewhere you have to fetch cash. So ladies has been, uh, been able to, you know, greatly anchor those activities and more so when it is a collaborative, you know, effort by the entire, you know, family per se, because, you know, a lot of these things happens on the family uh, level. So when she's busy, somebody else pitches in and then so on and so forth. So ladies at the forefront supported by family is the best model, which, you know, I have seen uh, working in India. Uh, uh, I'll rest, you know, on that. 
Thank you. And Sophia, you, you started actually mentioning uh, at the beginning um, your, your vision towards reaching out to more uh, more women merchants. Uh, um, could you just give a sense of what are the key challenges that you would face as Shari in doing so? Um, just to point out of potential collaboration areas with other organizations. Um, so we mainly work with mom and pop shops and, and small proximity stores and women are clearly underrepresented as it's a male dominant uh, business. I believe that having women agent is essential because as I mentioned earlier, I think end customers when there are women can relate more and feel more comfortable and safer speaking to a woman agent, at least at the beginning. So for me, it's it's crucial to, to manage to have some women agent just to make sure that uh, uh, other women can relate to them and reassure them. The way we have been thinking about having a women agent is looking looking at uh, uh, women dominated businesses uh, that are also proximity businesses. So for example, by going and looking for agricultural cooperatives who are usually held and managed by women in, in rural areas would be a solution to, to, to help onboard more uh, uh, women agents. And in terms of uh, uh, participation uh, of uh, of the public sector in order to to help us develop this i think in general public sector can help us develop uh, payments by you know deploying some specific uh, actions that can that will manage and encourage people to have their money in wallets for example in morocco we currently have what we call cnss uh, it's uh, um uh, the the national institution that helps uh, with the social uh, support that uh, is delivering uh, social uh, that is delivering uh, financial aid to uh, to some uh, families and they've passed a law where those aids will be directly deposited in in uh, in uh, basically payment accounts or or wallets. And these are the type of collaboration between a public institution and uh, financial institutions like payment institutions that can be very, very helpful and can push the usage of payment. Great, great point. Um, the G2P as a, as a Trojan horse to, to, to go on board more, more women customer and agents. Um, Hugo, over to you in terms of your experience onboarding women agents. I know you you did some work in, in DRC. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll start with typically the, the, the difficulties that, that we find on, on the model is that we want to onboard or our customers want to onboard women, but then there's the KYA KY restrictions. So typically not all uh, have a formal type of ID to, to to be a, a player on, on this space. Many of the businesses that, that they, they, they manage are registering the name of the husband. Uh, so that's that's another constraint that we find. The other point that Hamid uh, was was also mentioning that co culturally is exchanging uh, uh, cash and, 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 and flow is maybe it's not that oil down. So the family must be onboarded into, into this kind of uh, activities as well. So this is what we find as, as successfully. So the other point, is more related to to not owning a, a, a phone to operate. So that's the example that that I got from uh, from Mpesa uh, um, in, in in DRC. Basically, they 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 attached the model where they would uh, put a, a phone on the hands of, of the agent, and then the, the the phone would be paid back in, in commissions. It would be backed by by commissions. So technology wise, we we were. Uh, we set it up the environment so that it would be possible to pay your phone as as you move along and go on on, on your, your your revenue. So this would be possible to tap in into donor money to start an initiation project, but then put it running on a efficiently uh, economic commercial model. So that's what we find out. So it's uh, the, the success story comes in with some restrictions on on the environment, but it's incorporate the the, the family as as a union into into this uh, delivery model that uh, we find out that would make sense because of these uh, restrictions that uh, I've mentioned. But successfully, this uh, providing the, the subsidies for, for the device, paying paid back, it's a, it's a success case that, that intensifies and leverages 
on top of uh, women uh, agents. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great case of what, what private providers can do in, in a way to, to uh, in a way, subsidize or or it's an in kind loan, right? Uh, in a way, they they recuperate the cost of the device later through the fees of the woman agent. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. This has been a, an incredible discussion. We will. Um, uh, I, I just want to share two questions uh, in the time that that we have. Um, that uh, I think uh, uh, were, were interesting. Well. One is around, um, well, one is actually related to, to IDs. In Nigeria, um, um, the, there are, there's a lot of uh, IDs that um, are not owned by women. So how can we onboard women without IDs? It was one of the questions. I think that's, that goes to you, Ogwo. Um, so it's very similar to what you just mentioning around uh, your experience in DRC. How would you respond to to that? Thank you. So that, that that's a good question. So basically, the, the one of the difficulty uh, of, of this rollout is actually understanding the the participation level and what's the benefit of uh, at the end of the day having an ID. What what would be the the benefit for my daily life? Would I what would be the end goal for this? So I think the the point that uh, also Sophia mentioning about uh, women talking to women about the the benefits of this definitely there's there's a, a, a role uh, on on um, on uh, the, the faster and easy uh, acquisition of digitizing the the identity space and this is the entry space so into the digital econ economy so I see this as a, a, a typically as a, a a movement it's not formalized as a movement in in, in Nigeria. But if uh, we see tends to 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 have group of, of women communicating directly with with women, so that's something that uh, that uh, makes sense, and we see that even though it's not completely formalized by the central uh, bank uh, regulation uh, standpoint or identity. The difficulty that you have on identity space in Nigeria is that it's broken into two identities. That will be the financial identity and the civil identity, BVN and and and, and at at the end of the day, that also creates more more hassle into the the understanding of the full benefits and the 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 the, the not only for standardizing everything as you have, for example, in in, in India. So that's uh, in in a nutshell what uh, what I think it, it would be worth sharing. Thanks, Hugo. Um, and uh, and there are other alternatives and uh, for for the central bank to allow um, you know other types of IDs that could be promoted, but that requires central bank uh, uh, agreement on that, which goes to the point about uh, getting the low tier KYA requirements right that I made earlier. One question for Sophia: uh, How do you ensure that the delivery boys that you use don't run off with the cash? Uh, what are some of the risk mitigation? practices that you use for that? That's a very practical question. Yeah, this is a question I actually answered to uh, in the chat because I found it interesting. Listen, the deliverables are our employees. They worked with us. We uh, And like any employee that work with you, you run a background check and you we've been knowing them for a few years. Uh, we have a very uh, a strong process that uh, helped us uh, manage our cash management so they charge they, they have in the morning some um, some fmcg goods that they put in the trucks and deliver them so by the end of the day they already have a lot of cash there is a limit of cash they can put in their in their uh, in their trucks that is controlled by our tech systems and by the end of the day they need to come back and give the exact amount of money they have collected to either the cashier or the bank we have a very clear process where they they need a clearance by the end of the day to be able to work on the next morning we've never had any issues with that this is a, a process that has been in place and it that has been empowered thanks to some technology that we have developed internally and this is the exact same way that we will be handling this in terms of uh, of agents and cash management awesome and uh, maybe the last question for amit um this question uh is uh from uh, satish says how 
is your relationship with banks re uh, related to charges that they make when you know agent your agents use their branches? Um, I guess it refers to you know off us kind of transaction fees uh, when um, your agents are rebalancing. Um, are bars su supporting by reducing their bank charges on this uh, agent transfer fees? Okay, so if I've got it right, so uh, before I kind of jump onto this, I just add another thing to what Sophie has answered, you know, right now. In India, uh, you know, because we have found that, you know, uh, some models are not very successful. So we have, you know, primarily dependent on something called as a prepaid model, wherein, you know, we expect or believe, because ours is not an employee model as such. You know, there is a different, uh, there is a clear demarcation and differentiation between the model which, uh, which he's mentioning in, in our model. The, the agent has to bring in their own, you know, small amount of capital over a period of time. They keep earning, they keep on increasing, you know, this thing. We do help them in getting the, you know, the loans from other banks and everything, but it is finally their capital on which they work. And this model has, you know, expanded. So that in a way is a risk-free model from our perspective uh, for us to be able to scale up. So, so that's on the, you know, previous, uh, I wanted to comment. Now coming back to, you know, the charges and everything. See, the charges in India are twofold. One is, you know, when the customer belongs to our own bank, that's where, you know, we have a flexibility with regard to charging and which in a way, if you ask me, is market driven because, you know, uh, you can't be charging to less or you can't be charging to more uh, from other things. So it is entirely up to the, you know, the product line and everything. Then there are customers who belongs to other banks and who come and bank at our network or do transaction at our network. Because in India, we have a very, you know, clear system, uh, you know, uh, under NPCI where uh, people or, or, you know, the banks can do, uh, transactions for other banks as well. Uh, so, so within that network, the charges are defined by the NPCI. So, if you know what are the charges and everything, that is very clearly defined. So, there is no ambiguity. Uh, so, I guess you know probably I've been able to answer that uh, question if I've understood it cor correctly, or else I'm happy to address it again. Thank you, and and thank you all. Uh, unfortunately, we we run out of time. Uh, we we're a bit over time, and and but it's it just shows how 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 interesting the discussion has been and the questions that that we've been receiving uh, are, are a reflection of that. Well, thank you very much again for joining us. I hope uh, you know we've uh, in this webinar contributed to uh, creating a, a an international uh, network of. Uh, supporters of agent networks and you can share your own experience. I hope speakers remain in touch. I hope uh, our, our attendees also remain in touch and uh, to, to answer many, many more questions that were shared. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.